like he's squished can in them from down questions can tell us the cat on out kicking the hop tell you has this boost can I love the enemy he squeezed uh, Chichawaska, Pamela Barnes. Um, it's my honor to um, officially welcome you to the unceded uh, territory of the Sioux people. But before I do that, I want to first share with you a little bit about what our lands mean to us. So here in this part of Turtle Island, which is how we refer to North America, contact with others is fairly recent. It's about 200 years, where other parts of the continent, it's 500, 1,000 years, depending on where. With those newcomers came definitions that don't fit with our traditional um, historical concept of our relationship to the land. Um, one of those concepts is that of land ownership. We don't see ourselves as owners of the land in the same European or Western um, concept. We see ourselves as borrowing these lands from our great, 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 great grandchildren. And there's a really big difference between those two concepts, one of land ownership and that of borrowing. If I own this necklace. I can do what I want with it. I can sell it, I can trade it, I can give it away, I can take great care of it, or I can toss it on my nightstand. It's mine. I can do what I want with it. But if I borrow this, everything changes. I'm expected, first of all, to care for it to the very best of my ability. And there's an expectation that I leave it or return it in at least the same condition that I found it. Um, and if at all possible, better. I can't sell it. I can't trade it and I can't give it away. It's not mine to do that with. In our worldview, we recognize that we're here for a, only a moment in time. And that's part of that understanding of our borrowing all of this for, from the future generations. So it's with that understanding that our people first welcomed others to the traditional unceded territory of the Sioux people. And it's with that understanding that today I invite you and welcome you to the unceded territory of the Sioux people with the gentle reminder that none of us, including ourselves, are doing the best job that we can to take care of this for all of our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and so on and so forth. Linden. <laughs> He's great with it. Tell you, has the girl to who loved it. Why, he's not seal why we stiss. Who knows me he to the yayats them to speak cast with them to the speed them with up and our way pechum. He can stickle it. He can no quasti is make it. Well, tell you, has to go a lot. I lame them cool and didn't can't wish. Why could you get a la Tali has his boos? Who's the cool boy? That's guy again. He called it jit hooded. Jock has the hooded. 
thank the Creator for allowing me to say a few words, a little prayer. You know, the things that we that we do, we, we do with a, with a kind heart and an open heart. Um, we'll welcome you to, to our territory, to our land. You know, at this time of year, you know, the, the rains have come, the snow has come, and that's very good for the land. You know, the, when we got here, um, we all got here and, and we're enjoying, enjoying this evening or th today. And um, it's very good for us to be here. So thank you very much. Limelight. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. It's so nice to see everyone turn out for this wonderful talk. Um, first of all, uh, on behalf of our board of directors and staff, I would like to thank you all for joining us. Um, my name is Victoria Burge, and I am the Education Coordinator of Adult Programming here at the Kelowna Art Gallery. And before we begin tonight's talk, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which the gallery stands is the unceded traditional territory of the Okanagan built people. Now today, the Kelowna Art Gallery is pleased to introduce to you um, Melanie Daniel, and she is the artist behind our current exhibition, um, Going Where the Climate Suits My Clothes. Uh, this will be on display in our Reynolds Gallery until April 4th, 2021. A um, little bit about Melanie before we get started. She was born in Victoria, BC, and she completed her MFA at Bez Bezale? Bezalel. <laughs> Bezalel Academy in Israel. Uh, where she later became a professor. She was recently the Padnos Distinguished Artist in Residence at Grand Valley State University, Michigan. Um, Daniel's works are internationally exhibited, including solo shows at the Tel Aviv Museum, um, the Asaya Geisberg Gallery in New York, and Mindy Solomon Gallery in Miami. So just a few housekeeping rules before we get started and settled in to Melanie's talk. Um, I just ask everybody to please save their questions until the end. Um, there'll be 10 to 15 minutes reserved for a question and answer period. Um, at that time, please type your questions into the chat bar. And like I always, um, I will try to get to as many as possible um, before the end of our talk today. Um, one more thing to note is that today's lecture will be recorded for future viewing. So if you know of anybody who would like to catch this at a later date, uh, feel free to tune into our website and we'll have this up live as soon as possible. All right, thank you everybody. Enjoy the talk. Melanie, please take it away. <laughs> thank you for that beautiful introduction, Victoria. Um, I think we should probably just go to um, the page share. So. Maybe we could do that now and then I'll launch into the talk. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen with you now. So when I was preparing this talk, I wondered where I should begin. Should I start with images of melting icebergs, the aftermath of a hurricane, harrowing images of drought and starvation, wildfires in the Pacific Northwest, clear-cut logging in Canada or Brazil? Or should I start with art? The last option made me think about what it is that I do and how does this kind of painting figure into the greater scope of art history, specifically landscape painting? It's now the year 2020, nearly the end of 2020, and this being the postmodern era, art no longer supports a specific canon or school of thought. There is only art history and trends that come and go and everyone can find a niche for themselves. The canonical hierarchy has been left behind and that's a good thing. If I was pressed to the wall and had to place myself within a more rigid category of art making, I think I could say that what I do is a cross between landscape painting, largely figurative with abstract tendencies, as you can see, or you will see in a moment in the act of art making, uh, mark making rather, but with a narrative slant, I like to tell stories and always have. So, what is landscape painting? 
and I'm just going to delve briefly into a bit of art history here. So landscape painting arose as a distinct genre during the 17th century Dutch golden age as belief as sorry as religious art fell out of favor in a Protestant society. In Europe, landscapes evolved from just being backgrounds in portraits of wealthy landowners to later a prestigious art form that embraced by romantic painters in the 18th and 19th century. These romantic painters invested the natural world with allegorical and mythic significance in reaction to scientific advances of the Enlightenment. Later, landscape painting began to dominate American art in the early part of the 19th century with glorified images of a vast, unspoiled wilderness that reflected a nation whose identity and belief in its boundless prospects were deeply interwoven with its natural environment. As the American frontier was pushed further westward, landscape artists chronicled the disappearing wilderness and the price of modern progress. For example, the painters of Hudson River School with Thomas Cole as one of the predominant um, players in the latter half of the 19th century created works of very, very large scale that attempted to capture the epic scope of the American landscape that favored contemplation of natural beauty. Other Hudson River school artists created works that placed a greater emphasis on the raw, terrifying power of nature. Thomas Moran's painting of the Yellowstone River in the 1870s actually helped to persuade Congress to set aside the Yellowstone area as a national park. So even then, we were starting to see a kind of activism or pseudo-activism in art that was happening in this later, latter example. Um, I should probably mention that the, I suppose the uh, Canadian equivalent of this would be the famous group of seven and is currently being shown at the Kelowna Art Gallery. So privileged to show right next door to them. Um, my heroes, the artists I look to are younger still. They include Dana Schutz, Lisa Sanditz, Laura Owens, Daniel Richter, Peter Doig, Neo Rausch, um, Jules de Balincol, and the list is long. And I'm mentioning these artists not to simply drop names, but to reinforce the idea that art always begets art. It always comes from somewhere else before it goes through an artist's personal crucible. And the artists I've mentioned here are just some of the painters who have really influenced me and they are all artists who use the landscape to some degree as a stage for examining contemporary personal political or historical issues. I'm just going to um, take you aside for a second just so we can look at that um, the works of the artists I've just mentioned. So these works here um, are by Dana Schutz. She's uh, from New York, gestural narrative figure paintings and um, I'm quoting her now. She says, my paintings are loosely based on meta-narratives. The pictures flow in and out of pictorial genres. Still lives become personified. Portraits become events and landscapes become constructions. This is Dana Schutz. I remember when I first saw her paintings many years ago, um, it just really blew me out of the water and I think she she changed um, a lot for many of us when she um, rose to recognition. This is, is Lisa Sanditz, um, also a US painter. She explores the relationship between the natural landscape and commercialism. Her vibrant use of color and expressive forms create richly detailed works that look closely at production, urban development, and globalization. I can't remember the name of this painting, but I think it's something like sock farm. So you'll see these tube socks hanging in the foreground here and they just go on and on forever. Laura Owens, um, I don't have uh, many slides. Actually, I have just the one slide of her. Um, she's also a US artist and her work has changed actually very dramatically over the 
over the years. Um, her work now looks almost nothing like this. And I wanted to show you an example of her earlier works, um, which influenced me as well. And she features fantastical animals in highly illustrative settings and draws on Chinese and Japanese landscape painting, craft embroidery, and often bl blends abstraction, figuration, and decoration. And that is the only example that I have of her work. Um, this is Daniel Richter. He is a German artist known for his large scale paintings inspired by mass media and contemporary culture. He works within the tradition of expressionism. I'm just gonna flip to another slide here. Um, he's absolutely one of my favorite pa uh, painters. Uh, his paintings are just so, so good. And there are scenes that take place in both rural and urban settings and speak of violence, isolation, and the absurd through very expressive and sophisticated painterly language. Richter pushes the balance between abstraction and figuration. Some people in a life raft. Years from Afghanistan. Your doig. Um, I know Canada has claimed him, but he was born in Scotland, um, moved to Trinidad with his family, um, then to Canada, back to the UK, and then I believe finally he returned to Trinidad. Um, his paintings are characterized by their equal focus on both landscapes and figures, fusing art historical references and personal references. His works are both snapshots of his life and still universally relevant. He uses photos as references, but they're never derivative. That is to say, he never allows himself to become a slave to that image and they don't look like paintings that are trying to look like photographs. Um, he's fiercely eclectic and there's just so much detail and mark making in his works. This is Neo Rausch. He's from Leipzig. Um, very enigmatic compositions with eccentric iconography of human characters, hybrid animals in oddly familiar looking but um, very imaginary settings and they don't seem to belong to any particular time. It's like they're caught in a kind of time warp in different planes of existence. This is Jules de Barincol, French-born, lives in New York, best known for his atmospheric, often humorous paintings populated with small people, very saturated with colors, blurring the line between fantasy and reality. So this is mine, um, and I'm going to show you quite a few slides. Uh, my paintings haven't always been about climate change, um, but I've always relied on landscapes, mostly imagined landscapes, to play out subjects like, how does it feel to be an immigrant or a stranger in a new land? Or what does war and terrorism feel like? Or what does oppression look like? Um, I grew up in Canada and um, have traveled quite wild, widely and um, have lived in Israel for 25 years. And another subject that I have explored is can landscapes be a place to stitch together conflicting identities and so on. Some images now of my own works that relate to these subjects. And let's have a look at them now. This one's just called Disco Hybrid. Um, this was from a group I called Peacemaker, uh, written peace as in piece of cake, not peace as in not war. Um, written, um, oh, sorry, uh, combines Islamic geometric forms and Canadian natural elements. 
it's like quilt making. So I'm patching two very different cultures together. And I think all immigrants feel torn and divided no matter where they land or where they come from. This is called decoy. So it, it very much looks like, I guess, a kind of embroidered surface, um, all of these um, arabesque type patternings. And if you'll notice at the bottom left, or sorry, bottom right hand corner, there's, um, it almost looks like a cut out of a plywood um, deer shaped image. It's just propped up by a piece of wood. So I guess that would be the decoy, but it's sort of tongue in cheek about, I guess the act of painting, but also, um, the issues I mentioned before about um, shifting identities. This is called uh, Nargila or a water pipe. So we've got this Canadian looking forest with a water pipe placed on a water on a wooden stump. And this is just simply called canary. So if you look closely, there's a little yellow canary there. Um, sort of camouflaged, um, perched on a wooden branch. Now this is from a completely different group of paintings. Um, and I normally work in groups, so very large groups of usually 30 paintings per group. And um, they eventually become exhibited, um, not all of them. So I'm just showing you uh, small samples from each group. So this one is from a group called AFTER. Um, AFTER is actually a British military slang that Israelis adopted, which refers to military leave or rest and relaxation. And I was thinking of a situation after a lasting peace treaty or the reverse, a total war, in which we see these reservist soldiers naked, unarmed, and not doing much, just hanging around. They all have these identity tags on their necks. So this one is just called coordinate. So if you look, it's quite different than the images that I just showed you. And the picture is made up of zones, patches. This one just has two um, young reservists leaning against a uh, sheik's or sheikh's grave resting called Shin Gimer. This is just an installation shot um, where I did an exhibition at Noga Gallery in Tel Aviv, just to give you an idea of scale. And this is called Fields in the Valley. So nice idyllic looking view, uh, farming fields and so on. But if you look closely, uh, there are these cubes or these blocks that um, are quite typically seen in roads connecting cities to um, say uh, Palestinian territories in um, that part of the world. So they're just these massive concrete blocks that are uh, impossible to pass. This one's just called Pawn. So a kind of Shangri-La soldiers standing under a makeshift shower in the desert. And when I exhibited this, I actually never showed it in North America. I, I meant for this group of paintings to be shown in, in Israel. And um, it was very specific to that population. Um, oddly, when I showed this, um, I had a lot of people approach me and there was a kind of a great divide between men and women. Uh, women saw these paintings as a kind of anti-war statement and men recognized it as a almost uh, like a getaway from their uh, daily lives and uh, wives and families and kind of a, a, a camp or a getaway. Um, so it was very interesting to me how, how uh, men and women viewed this um, exhibition very differently. Um, this is from another group um, called Echo Shield that I actually painted in Canada um, about eight years ago. And um, this one's called Jerusalem. 
these focus on uh, existential threat of being in a land constantly in upheaval. And if you look closely, the landscapes are littered with shrapnel and barbed wire, invisible mapping, roadblocks, surveillance towers, violence, and all point to anxiety of both the controlled and the controller. The next slide. This is a massive painting called Pact. Um, it's sort of the idea is us versus them. Um, it's it looks like it's upside down, so that sort of phallic looking thing in the center of it is um, a surveillance tower. Uh, it's concrete. So what I did was just paint this and invert the same image and painted it using a different color scheme. Um, but you can see sort of flares or walls. It's dark and personal. Clouds are strange, they look like holes in the sky. This is called flag. There is a Star of David in the middle, but it's um, completely fragmented and broken. And, you know, things that look like maybe uh, flowery blooms could be, I guess, seen as bruises. Um, there's all these calligraphic marks all over the place. This is called gamma charged. Um, that strange geometric shape is, it's a bomb shelter. So we're quite used to seeing these around Israel. <clears throat> I've spent some time in one or two. Um, and the not so distant past. <coughs> this one's called checkpoint. Um, and it's very dense, very dark. Uh, there's kind of a push for total um, fragmentation and obliteration of the uh, objects there. And this one is called Echo Shield. It's a very large work, um, very detailed, built up, and still has kind of a raw and unfinished quality with this push for disintegration. Um, it's actually uh, the dome inside of a mosque. So the name Echo Shield actually came to me mid process while I was making this group. And I was thinking about um, echo. So it's kind of like a shout into space that's returned to the center, but here it, it, rec it ricochets. So I was trying to translate that auditory effect into a visual one. And then the word shield makes you think of a protective element, which um, here in this group, it could be a dome. Um, and once it's inverted, becomes a it can become a parabolic satellite dish or a rainbow, an oriental arch, or a crescent moon. Um, I'm backtracking a little bit more here to another group. Um, this is from 2010. Um, this one's called Kings of the Frontier, and it's from a group that I did called Captivity Tales, and it's about a sense of dislocation. Um, I think that it, it's something that never leaves me and it emanates from my position as a citizen of two new worlds, each one a hybrid existence. And Captivity Tales were um, exaggerated accounts published and quite widespread during the colonial era. And here, the tales act as a kind of metaphor for my uh, sometimes incomprehension at uh, what a strange land I, I'm living in and how identities remain fixed. That means to say, you are who you are, you don't change. And despite, you know, moving to one country or another and my experience was not one of pure assimilation um, nor adoption, but just kind of grasping at building borders and defining places. Um, but in these works, uh, wilderness always kind of prevails. So here you'll see these, they're, they're howling wolves head, but they're impaled on these sticks that come out of these uh, kind of artistically shaped <laughs> stands. Now this one, I wonder if I could, zoom in for you. It's just simply called Prospector. And I was thinking of the Coureur de Bois. So this guy, his, I don't know, do you, I'm not sure if you're getting that zoom in, but his head is just sitting on that stump. <laughs> this is called Satellite Totem. It's made up of, it's about one, two, three, four, five, six pieces. <laughs> six 
canvases. And um, as you'll see, the eye on one side of the head is, is a satellite that seems to be emitting a pulse. And the other eye is just this kind of dead and flattened eye that actually is covered with black glitter, but you don't get that in the photograph here. And, and then the arms are a kind of uh, open, stretched out uh, deer antlers. And the rest of it's just this floral bloom. Now this one is called Ghost World. That's from 2014. And again, this kind of inversion. So the real world is at the bottom. The ghost world is at the top. This one's called Two Shores Away and Still Sloshing. Um, from a group that I did called Lotus Eaters. It's an allusion to the mythological island dwellers um, struck with a narcotic peacefulness, um, slightly Homeric in its um, reference. And I'm basically hinting at my utopic wish for apathy and a kind of escapism. Um, here, the world is flooded. I don't know if you can see him, but uh, there's a man towing a dinghy and he's got a nice, uh, cannabis plant that I think is the only thing that he really wants to save. <laughs> this one is called Lotus Eaters, so a sleeping youth. Fool's Gold. There are these, uh, I think, three small figures um, beneath that um, propped up sculpture, um, a structure rather. I'm not sure if anyone can see that. I'm not sure how well these images are sharing, but I'm just keeping my fingers crossed here. Um, going back further yet to 2009, I made a series of paintings called Evergreen. Um, it was exhibited in the Tel Aviv Museum. And basically I painted my family and quite often they are camouflaged in forests and tropical areas. Again, this is a kind of yearning to belong somehow, I guess, to assimilate, but also just a kind of fond looking back to my family. So my grandmother actually had an Austin um, mini it was orange, so I painted this one green. And this is called Peacock. So it's actually a picture of me <laughs> and my son, surrounded by all of this quite luscious foliage and our reflection in the water. I'm blue. <laughs> and this is called Quilted Land. So a lot of attention to the land. Um, I, I actually really love painting foregrounds and always have. <laughs> so it never becomes just sort of dead white space or an afterthought. It becomes quite a, a rudimentary part of the painting. And this one is from the same group. It's called The Quiet Man and His Horse. If you look very closely, you'll see um, a dark figure, sort of a shadowy figure there leaning against one of those palm trees and then two horses. So in the last several years, I have turned my focus to ecological concerns and it's a subject that has always been relevant to me but hasn't appeared in my own art making until more recently. Um, these that I'm about to show you are from an exhibition that I did in New York at the Asia Geisberg Gallery called Late Bloomers. So my paintings are scenes that reveal themselves a little at a time and you see places with people busying themselves in their uncanny worlds. And on the surface of it, there's a feel of paradise or playtime with bubblegum color and 80s teal, swaying palm trees, everything's great. But sometimes there's a kind of a pervading disquiet that lurks in the details. So here we've got this uh, young woman with her um, tools on her hips and she's basically uh, built a cow. 
um, there's an underlying duality and uncertainty in many of these paintings. And this is the view of a disillusioned post 9-11 generation to which I belong, which makes this, the scene strange. And the landscapes teeter a fine line between utopian and dystopian narratives. And I'm actually terrified at what our planet is becoming. We're on the verge of extinction ourselves. So these works are not just sun-drenched paradises, but about groups of well-meaning people who are trying to make things right. And I would identify with them if they were real people. And I actually try to surround myself with such people in real life. They're often funny or absurd paintings because I'm not very good at painting calamity so directly. And I think they show people um, performing DIY everything from digital detox to beekeeping to craft work or recycling water with rainbows <laughs> over them. Um, I look at painters like Peter Doig, whom I showed you earlier, or David Hockney. Both painters I absolutely adore. But I think their generation had more faith in the future that things would turn out okay. And if not, it didn't matter because things just have a way of working out. My generation, Gen X and millennial generation is far more apprehensive and skeptical. It's just a more complicated world and it's increasingly difficult to respond to it. So this one is called um, Goat Love in a Digital World. So if you'll notice, there's a little wicker basket. I don't know if you can see my pointer here um, on the bottom right hand corner with uh, just digital devices and then these youth that are trying to care for these goats, feeding them, petting them, trying to get them out of the trees. Um, I think this one's called Hot House Artist. So um, a youth bent over painting rocks and placing them around this geodome. This is from the exhibition in New York. And um, I also made sculpture for this exhibition. Um, they're now on view at the Cologne Art Gallery. And they're basically all of the flora that's kind of leapt out of the painting. So they're, they're freak specimens that, that actually, you know, could exist in my paintings. Um, That one's called Rainbow Colony. So you'll see, you know, people meditating, don't panic, it's organic, <laughs> recycling water and rainbows, utopia, right? This one's just called Too Late, or no, sorry, it's not, it's called The Queen's Decree. So um, we've got a, a very colorful apiary, two beekeepers, and then um, it's probably very hard to see on this um, scale, but it just says too late in the back. So the bees have clustered together and formed that sentence. This is just called the new gods, terrariums, or worshiping them. I'm going to flip through these quickly. Um, so my paintings are not about any specific place. They could be anywhere, which makes them personal, but at the same time, um, global. I want to show you images from my recent show um, at the Grand Rapids Art Museum. Um, some of those works are now also at the Kelowna Art Gallery. Um, the show at the Kelowna Art Gallery includes uh, some other works and, um, and a stop motion animation. And the exhibition is called Going Where the Climate Suits My Clothes. So, um, getting back to this painting, which is called Only Four Degrees, um, in this group, what I'm aiming for is to have my paintings reflect back the evidence of us humans marking our ways everywhere on the planet. We're collecting, cooking, extracting, producing, and our species footprint um, is everywhere. Um, and and um, just I lost my train of thought here. So through each of these landscapes, it's radiating the kind of futility and escapism and absurdity and optimism. But um, so maybe pointing to the potential to change our, our course and reconnect to the natural world. Um, 
they're very bright paintings, most of them, um, a lot of fluorescent pinks. And uh, I think with color being so dominant in many of these works, they take on even a kind of declarative position. And I have to say that I see a kind of chromophobia that runs through much of Western visual culture. Um, color denotes something lurid or less serious, while the absence or the restraint of color is seen as indicative of a deeper intellectual engagement. So these are the assumptions I detect in the culture at large. But in fact, some time ago, I found a reference to a review by Roberta Smith in New York Times, uh, which she very offhandedly mentions how the absence of color in these particular exhibited paintings, not mine, someone else's, that uh, denotes um, a seriousness in the work. And this to me is a perfect example of how entrenched that suspicion of color is in Western culture. So I guess I, I use color because I love it, but also as a kind of confrontational tool in some ways, and maybe it'll act as kind of a, a shaker, upper, or destabilizing force. So um, I think maybe I should talk a little bit about the main ideas behind this exhibition. Um, and the title of this work, again, is Only Four Degrees. So it it basically refers to the effects of a four degree Celsius rise in average temperature and, and what effects that could have on the planet. So few serious scientists doubt that climate change is happening or that it is man-made, but the fact remains that we still have a hard time grasping global warming and what it will look like in the years to come. Um, ideally, uh, this is for just for information, this is, uh, I think it's over three meters long. It's a very large painting. And ideally in a painting this size, a painter should scale up um, and make everything much bigger and fuller rather than shrink <laughs> things, rather than focus on this uh, like Hieronymus Bosch like details and figures. But um, I wanted to load the canvas with the sad detritus of human invention after a hurricane with the sole figure, as you can see, planted right in the middle there, um, trying to power his laptop with pineapple energy. Acting alone to rebuild and sustain a world is a chaotic notion and uh, kind of futile. Um, when I give artist talks, I'm, I'm often asked when I first became concerned about humanity's impact on the planet. Um, well, growing up in Western Canada with its vast forests, and glacial rivers has left a very deep impression on me. And I'm actually never happier than when I'm outside in all kinds of weather, in fact. <laughs> I think I'd be happier off as a human being if I were a farmer and not an artist, but that's for a different conversation. Um, as a university student, I earned money during the summers as a tree planter. And I was part of a team that was hired to replant clear-cut forests, that, which were sometimes hours away, and sometimes we had to be airlifted into our work zones. It was the hardest work I've ever done, not only because of the physical demands of planting around um, 2,000 small trees a day, which we called plugs, but mainly because of the isolation and repetition. And it was the first time that I saw clear-cut logging from this prox proximity, and it was uh, just devastating. Once I found a strange pile of white spots curled up in a slash pile, and when I got close to it, um, it opened its enormous black eyes and didn't move. It was just a small fawn waiting for its mother. So it was now an anomaly in this new environment at ground zero. Um, another thing that was huge for me and that opened my eyes regarding management of precious resources um, was what I learned about water management in the Middle East. So while living in Israel, I learned about the powerful story of water preservation when the country was formed in 1948, Israel designed one of the world's most successful water infrastructures. Water legislation was and still is centralized. It belongs to no one and everyone. Israeli citizens are painfully aware of the scarcity of water and take every measure to ensure it is used efficiently in homes, industry, and agriculture. Israel recycles about 70% of its water. In the US, 1% is recycled. Um, Today, I was trying to look up numbers for Canada, and from what I could see, um, I think it, the numbers are quite similar to the US numbers, so very low.
I learned it was possible for governments to harness natural resources using ethical and sustainable models and within such a paradigm through education and sheer necessity, citizens become wardens of the environment. Um, another question that I'm often asked is um, the places where I've lived. How have they contributed to my outlook in life and how have they informed my work? Well, um, just a, a short aside, before returning to Kelowna, where we are now, British Columbia, um, my family and I was living in Grand Rapids, Michigan for three years and prior to that Israel. So I was, I was a visiting um, artist and professor at one of the state universities there. And I would say that um, that time in Grand Rapids, Michigan really opened my eyes to something I was exposed to in Canada, but hadn't experienced with as much intensity. And that thing is consumerism. We like to buy stuff. Everything is cheaper and more readily available in North America than in um, many other countries I've lived in or visited. And while much of the world has acknowledged that we are all in the same boat and we must act collectively to prevent our own extinction, um, Americans, as well as my fellow Canadians, generally still feel a deep sense of entitlement to use natural resources as a way of maintaining a very high standard of living. This is a dangerous and outdated philosophy, and one which is deeply and historically ingrained in our culture. This dominant attitude stands in very sharp contrast to those of uh, First, First Nations peoples. There is a common saying among among them that we must always consider the results of our deeds on the seventh generation after our own. Um, after I made these paintings, let's see, um, I wanted to fill a second smaller room. This is, I'm sort of backtracking again to the show in the Grand Rapids Museum uh, with something that had a totally different feel. Um, so I decided to make all these drawings and ceramic volcanoes. So um, I'll show you images of those very shortly. And the volcanoes are basically metaphors or even scapegoats for climate change. Simple. Um, I think as humans, we have, maybe I'll just skip, uh, I'll show you some of these first. So this work is also at the Kelowna Art Gallery. It's just simply called Villagers. So we've got a makeshift uh, you know, tent or tarp over this um, meal that's being prepared by these people in a jungle-like setting. Everyone has a little job to do. This one's just called Your, Dra Your Daydreaming. So a uh, woman in the foreground, just sort of resting, her hand is stuffed in this monster's mouth, and then there's this hand beckoning to her, and then more yogists, I guess, in the background. This one's called Mission. The line in the middle is just because it's two separate panels, it's a diptych. And you'll see a, a raft, and in the middle of that raft, there's that round object. It's just a tiny globe-like, terrarium with a tiny cactus in it. And then these two people just trying to navigate their way over this flooded area. Um, hot house ghost, I think, a greenhouse ghost. There's a little hand there holding the watering container. This one's called civic planning. So um, black people, brown people, white people, old, young, all together, men, women, trying to rebuild our world. They're all hollow, hollowed eyed. Um, one is sticking her finger in the mouth of a volcano, but a daunting task to rebuild our civilization. This one's called an eye for beauty. So a youth standing on a mountain ledge, just taking pictures of themselves, not really looking at the view. This is also at the Kelowna Art Gallery, called Honey Grind. Um, so I'm going to zoom in here. I hope this works for you. Um, if you'll notice, these two uh, beekeepers are quite camouflaged, and they've set up a uh, beekeeping section inside of this abandoned pool, which could have been once upon a time uh, a water park of sorts, and then this girl just riding her skateboard around the edge of it. So 
throat. Um, so I'm just going to skip forward here. So I think um, we have a propensity for the theatrical and it's easy to imagine the worst. Just look at all the B movies about the end of the world or zombie apocalypse. Um, and yet the scary business of climate change isn't sexy. The most imperceptible decline is hard to grasp because it just lacks drama. Um, we're also very good at adapting to change with modern conveniences like supermarkets, air conditioning, indoor plumbing and filtration technologies. We just don't notice the harrowing changes happening now on our planet. And since my paintings are more suggestive and absurd, ecological subtext isn't immediately apparent. And um, I've said this before, but I don't want to paint death and destruction because nothing would be left to the imagination. So rather than blame human excess for this ecological imbalance, let us instead, let us say instead that climate change is a global conspiracy cooked up by volcanoes and scientists who want to institute massive government control of the economy and the energy sector. On the flip side, we would have breathtaking sunsets. Here's old man Vulcan sitting on a volcano, smoke coming out of his ears. A reveal ostrich with her head in the sand or woman with her head in a volcano, little rainbow. These are all handmade paper. Goodbye sun. I'm sure many people in the Okanagan and British Columbia and actually further on um, saw what that looked like this summer. Go outside, you can't see the sun, don't need sunscreen. Be happy the sun is shining today. And we have the best sunsets. <laughs> so on the flip side, we would have breathtaking sunsets. And I think I will leave it there. And if anyone, we're going to move now to our Q&A portion. So I'm gonna shrink my screen here and get rid of these images. And back to you, Victoria. Perfect, that was fantastic. Thank you, Melanie, and thank you thank for you sharing. for having me. Yeah, thank you for sharing so many new images of your work. It, it was so wonderful to see such a vast range and, and to see uh, those other artists who have inspired you. It's great. Um, so I'll give everybody a, a few seconds um, here to think of some questions. If you have anything you'd like to ask Melanie, just type them into the chat bar um, and I'll, uh, I'll verbalize them for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I did have one question actually halfway through the talk um, from Peter, and he was asking, what is your definition of painting? So I guess if you could define it, how would you do that? That's a, um, that's a very big <laughs> question. <It> <laughs> I could ramble on about this for days. I don't think you want me to do that. <laughs> um, my definition of painting. Um, <laughs> Look, I can, I can tell Peter what it is that I look for when I go uh, to see exhibitions or friend studios and the things that get me most exciting is, um, is to see like a kind of manipulation of the material of the paint. And um, obviously it's kind of hard to invent anything new. It kind of, everything's been more or less done. So I mentioned that earlier that art begets art. So um yet yeah, there still is room for um some level of invention i think but i i look really at how something is painted and um i like to see i guess a kind of struggle um that's not to say angst or anything like that but that that maybe it just didn't happen with the, the greatest of ease for that painter, that there was kind of a search there. And, and I think for me, when I'm, when I'm working in a studio, uh, having um, things happen and pop up that surprise me that I can't anticipate or don't plan for. And 
um, just to loosen the reins on what, let's say, my original plan was for a certain painting or a group of paintings and to just let, at some point, the painting dictates me what it needs and to go from there. And um, that might sound sort of like, I don't know, witchcraft or something. And I'd say to some degree it sort of is, but uh, <laughs> but um, I think that's that's how we learn just by um, making tons of mistakes and and going into uncharted waters with ourselves and in our studios and um, you really can only be yourself. So um, I don't think it's really a matter of you know having a great concept or a great idea and 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 then reverting to a kind of copywriting where you you execute that idea. If you do that, then you don't really leave a lot of room for um, experimentation or like I said surprise so mm -hmm. I, I'm not really sure if I've answered this question adequately but great great insight nonetheless um, <clears throat> I have another question here from Kathy um, she's asking what art mediums do you use uh, acrylic oil um, any techniques and she says the colors are beautiful and as well as the imagery so yeah any any techniques in particular you, you could share with us um, thank you, Kathy. Uh, it's always nice to hear. Um, I, I us usually use oils, so I'm most comfortable with that because you can uh, really manipulate them and abuse them. And um, they, they just, I mean, I've tried working with acrylics and hated it. I'm just not good at it. They dry up too quickly and they can't be smushed around or I don't know. Um, have you spray paints and things like that and sometimes I will use some level of acrylic underneath it, like washes and things just to accelerate the whole process so that I don't have to wait around for days or use you know um, other kind of media it's like as a, as a way of layering and stuff so yeah. <clears throat> wonderful and and that actually leads quite well into Sarah's question about how long your paintings usually take to make not long. <laughs> <laughs> they look like they would take a really long time because of the scale of them, for sure. Um, sometimes the big ones can take a lot longer, but I, when I'm in a like, like real gung-ho working mode, I will make, you know, possibly four paintings a month, and some of them can be big, um, but it's the little ones that kill me. They're hard. It's really hard for me. Um, I've seen other artists, artists pull it off with ease working on a small format. I just feel like um, you can't get away with as much when we're working on a small format. So like if you're working on a you know, giant painting, you, you, you work from your, your shoulder and not from you know, your wrist. So you can get away with these large gestural strokes that, that look grand, you know, full of bravura, but um, the little ones or they don't let you BS. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, got a question here from Teresa and she's asking, is your art sold to large corporations and how do they respond to your theme? Oh, I've never been asked that question. Yes, I've, uh, my paintings have been sold to, you know, the evil of evils to banks. And <laughs> so <laughs> I guess that makes me a bit of a hypocrite. But um, yeah, they're in different collections, you know, private collections. And um, I can't say that I've sold to um, Mon Monsor. I can't remember. There's uh, some conglomerate that um, is really ruining all farmers lives and everything so nothing like that but they wouldn't be interested in anything I make anyway so wonderful I'm just reading here um, Connor tuned in he says hello uh, really enjoyed your show in the talk um, he said he figured straight away that you were influenced by the work of Dana uh, Schultz uh, he said he loves his her work himself um, her starting point for a painting is often verbal or textural, an inquiry or a question, i.e. how does a person eat their own face? Curious where the starting point is for making a painting yourself. Is it something verbal? Question mark. Um, my answer is going to be sort of boring because I, I bore myself. I've just come, I've been doing this long enough to realize that I, there's only so much reinvention I can, um, 
I can create in myself. That is to say, I just, I'm always who I'm going to be. So basically I feel like I'm just recycling um, nightmares. <laughs> so it sounds terrible <laughs> to say that. And um, you and I were talking, Victoria, the other day. Yeah. And I just said that for me, there's absolutely nothing therapeutic about painting. I'm just like, a, it's a, it's a job. So I, I, I just start from, um, whenever I start a new work or a, a new group of paintings, I work in groups and they're not one-offs. Um, it's gotta be some kind of idea or feeling or something that I can tap into that's very close to me, close to my own personal experience that can carry me and that is mine, uh, completely mine. And that, um, um, that will just, you know, help me catalyze enough material for the rest of the, of the group. And it doesn't usually start with an image or a sketch or anything like that. I'm really bad at um, sketching my ideas out. I usually make these things that look like grocery lists and just start brainstorming and, and writing lists and lists of things of, um, that are connected to that you know, idea where I, I can sort of narrow it down and say, that's what I wanna do this next group about. And, and, then, and then I'll map out these things that they actually look like maps or I'll have arrows pointing everywhere like, okay, let's try this and here brown, here that, and like maybe that'll work. But I don't ever do any preliminary sketches or drawings um, that lead up to my paintings. It just, um, I don't know why I've never been good at that because I also feel like if I did that, I might be kind of locked into a kind of commitment with that preliminary drawing or sketch for the painting. And then I wouldn't be able to like abandon that if I needed to part way in order to just keep going. And like I said before, giving the painting what it needs in order to mm -hmm. make it good <laughs> and satisfy Absolutely. my demands of what a good painting ought to be. So mm -hmm. um, I have another question here from Jeanette uh, asking if you could talk about the stop motion animation piece a little bit. Oh, I wanted to show it to you. <laughs> Maybe we, we could can do it because it's only two minutes long and I yeah, did discuss this and I feel so stupid now that um, for the, uh, I'll just, can I give the blurb now? So like I, um, yeah. when I was invited to do this show at the Kelowna Art Gallery, most of the works had already been made and exhibited in other museums and galleries, but I really wanted to do something local and I wanted to do something new that would um, connect the show with Kelowna. Um, so I get kind of bored being, my, be, being by myself in my studio. So sometimes it's fun to do a collaborative project. So for that, I actually thought, wouldn't it be cool to take that painting, the large one, um, only four degrees and use that as a reference for stop motion animation. So I talked to my 11 year old son, Ido, and he's been doing stop motion actually since March, since this pandemic started and got, he's gotten quite good at it. And I thought, how would you like to do something with your class at school? So I got permission from um, the school and his class and um, I was very happy to work with them. Um, basically they helped us build the props and the sets for this. Um, and then my uh, nephew, the same, is a very talented musician and a professional musician. He uh, wrote the score and he came with me on a separate occasion to the school and we actually recorded live sounds with the students. Um, anything from rapping their knuckles on desks to making city noises and honking sounds with their mouths to screaming. Um, <laughs> librarian didn't care for that very much, but it <laughs> gave us like great sound. So um, we just ended up doing um, a stop motion that was a kind of uh, tableau vivant or um, living painting. So rather than have you know actors standing around mimicking what's on the canvas, um, we turned it into a, a short animation that's really cute. <laughs> we should show it. Um, yeah. So maybe we'll do a few more questions and then we'll show it for those that are still. <laughs> sure. Actually, I well, I have. Maybe just one more question, and then I think we should definitely show it. It would be a great Let's, way to finish okay, wrap off it the up. talk. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one more question here from Sheila. Uh, she's asking, who owns your paintings, and what happens to them after you stop exhibiting them? 
Um, it depends. So I work with um, a number of um, commercial art galleries around the world. And um, so uh, more often than not, the paintings are sold to collectors through the gallery. Um, and I don't usually see them again after that. And sometimes I don't even know where they are or who bought them. Um, and um, but usually I try to pull back. Uh, one or two from each group, just for myself, for my own personal archive. And I wish I had done this um, earlier and had been more methodical about it because there are some paintings that I've sold that now I just weep about it and just because they, you know, maybe had sentimental value for me and I just really kicking myself <laughs> down. Yeah. They were sold and then I allowed that to happen. But um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's hard knowing what's what's right to let go of and what needs to stay near. <laughs> yeah, well, right. usually, I mean, I have no, I'm fine with, you know, letting them go, quite the contrary, very happy to sell them, but um, wish I had maybe not done that as much. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my last question here is from Jude, and she's just wondering um, which song you're referencing in the title to this show. Ah, okay, so it's from the um, Midnight Cowboy uh, movie, and I think it's uh, Harry Nielsen. So there have been different renditions of this song over the years, but that's the source. <laughs> awesome. Wonderful. That was her guess, actually. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, so let's go ahead, and if you could share your screen again, and okay. we'll watch the video. All right. Um... I'm going to shrink you for a second here. Let's see. Yes. Okay, whoop, I got to pause this thing. Hold on. do things. So the pineapples was just, I just, I wanted uh, a kind of plant or fruit that looked really funky. And that was the thing that just, they're just goofy looking fruit. And I thought I could make a whole bunch of these and really love making them. I mean, if I made apples or lemons, it just wouldn't be the same. They're not as exotic. So a pineapple just 
it looks funny. So that's the only reason. <laughs> just I love cause. it. It's <laughs> a great, great answer. I do. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, Melanie, for answering all of our questions. And thanks again for your wonderful talk. Um, again, anybody who's interested in seeing Melanie's work, uh, come check it out here at the gallery. Um, it'll be on display until April 4th. Uh, thanks, everybody, and have a great night. Bye, Melanie. Thank you. Bye.